Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. I'm Anna Edwards. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll bring you your guide to the region's 1 trillion euro market in exchange traded funds. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. The highest daily volume for any security in history. As a single ETF sees $113 billion of trade, we'll ask how the market held up. European ETFs end the month with inflows of almost 6 billion euros. We'll look at what investors are buying and selling as volatility rises. And the rise of the robots will discuss thematic investing and an exchange-traded fund that bets on automation. Good morning, everybody. Let's get straight to our top story. Record volumes have been providing a test for the resilience of exchange-traded fund markets. In one day, an ETF tracking the S&P 500 saw $113 billion uh, traded, the highest volume in a single security in history. Meanwhile, the iShares iBox high-yield corporate bond ETF suffered a 28% drawdown from its peak as investors bailed out of riskier assets. So how did the market cope with the surge in turnover. Joining us this morning, Stephen Cohen, head of iShares EMEA at BlackRock, uh, uh, and from Zurich, Thomas Mertz is also with us, head of European distribution at Vanguard. And from Bloomberg Intelli Intelligence, Athanasios Sarafagis is with us here on set in London. Uh, Athanasios, thank you very much for, for coming to join us. So from an issuer perspective, who were the leaders and the laggards then in this uh, this this testing time, this peak, this, uh, peak time for volumes at least? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously it was a rough couple of weeks, right? So there's been a lot of outflows in the industry. Even though the month of February ended up being positive in terms of flows, but if you sort of look at which issuers did well, anyone that was offering sort of safe haven assets, so gold funds, right, like DWS, Wisdom Tree had held up pretty well. Um, on the opposite side, fixed income just frankly was hit a little bit harder, especially some high yield funds. iShares just uh, has a bulk of the fixed income assets there, so they tended to be hit a little bit more um, during these sell-offs. But um, overall, still, the industry did have positive flows in February, I think, is noteworthy. Yeah, and so all in all, how would you say that the ETF market has dealt with this exceptional period of volume? There's always this critique that it, they haven't been tested, right? I mean, if this, I think, definitely constitutes as a, as a test period. Um, and when you sort of think about even the genesis of the ETF and why it was created, it was created after the 87 crash, right? The SEC said, well, if there was maybe a way that we could, instead of trading stocks, we could trade a basket that represents stocks or a security that represents a basket of stocks. ETFs were sort of meant to, to add this liquidity buffer. like, And I think we saw that a lot this week across equities, across high yield, across all these different products. Okay, I think Thank you. Athanasios Sarafagis joining us from Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, let's get into our conversation with our guests now. More from BlackRock's Stephen Cohen and Thomas Mertz from Vanguard. Um, but first, let's take a look at what's uh, hot in the world of ETFs this week. Which countries and sectors have been attracting the money? Uh, in fact, let's not do that. Let's get back to our guests. In fact, let, that's what we were meant to do uh, in this stage of the in this stage of the programme. Stephen, let's come to you first then. Um, how do you think that the ETF market has been tested over the, uh, over the most recent period of incredible volume in many asset classes? Mm. I, th I think it's been, uh, we've seen a number of periods like this, particularly in US high yield over the last few years, um, where, we've, where we've seen uh, significant volumes, uh, significant changes in the liquidity of the underlying market, uh, and the ETFs have done, done incredibly well. They've done what investors want from them. I think this is a really interesting period because uh, we continue to see that in the US high yield market, but also, arguably for the first time in Europe, we saw volumes that we've just not seen before. So uh, over the period of the last week, we've seen nearly $100 billion trading in secondary uh, ETF volumes in Europe. Um, that's twice what we would have seen in any normal week in 2019. Mm. When you look at the primary market, the kind of creation redemption market, it's three, four times what we would have seen in a normal week uh, last year. Um, and again, the products continue to work. Investors have, whether they've been buyers or sellers, uh, they've been able to access markets or um, get liquidity in terms of exiting positions, uh, as they would expect. So I think it's been a great period, actually, for the potential future growth of the market. Thomas, your thoughts on how the ETF market has weathered this particular storm? Yeah, I can only echo what just been said, right? So ETFs delivered what uh, they expected to, and I think it's very interesting to see that um, on the RFQ platforms, the uh, volumes was really 
uh, massively increase, uh, while on, on exchange the increase kind of was more moderate. Um, and, and that indicates very clearly that still in Europe that is a clear case of uh, wholesalers, like professional buyers and sellers, are still dominant in that market. But overall, I would uh, agree what just been said. Uh, ETFs really delivered what they um, expected to do, um, giving quick access, um, being able to adjust the portfolio, rebalance portfolio, and um, you know, therefore steer the portfolio in the right direction. Uh, Stephen, when you hear some people talk about the way that ETFs haven't been tested in the past mm. or maybe they uh, perhaps they even exacerbate uh, periods of market volatility, is there any part of that that sticks with you or do you think we, need, do you think we can move on from that kind of conversation? Well, I think we always get, we always get asked well, what happens in 2008, what would happen again? Um, and clearly, you know, we haven't seen a, a full-on 2008 scenario, but we've seen the biggest sell-off in equities uh, since 2008 in terms of speed of market. Uh, we've seen some pretty stressed credit markets over the last two weeks. Um, and as I say, I think, you know, uh, the experience for investors who were either buying or selling, uh, either in the secondary market or in the kind of primary creation redemption market has actually been very, very good. Um, the other thing which is really interesting is that we, in, in periods like this, and this has been another very good example, we see new investors coming to the ETF. Uh, and this is something we've seen over the last kind of three or four years, particularly in the US, and we're starting to see in Europe now, which is when you have periods like this, actually um, many new investors of all types start to gravitate towards the to ETFs because this actually becomes the most efficient way to shift the portfolio very quickly when you know, markets are very volatile and very, very uncertain, particularly institutional investors. Mm. And the more of those types of investors you have coming into the product, the more the volumes grow. That actually attracts new investors to feel this is yeah. a, an area where we can get uh, uh, exposure. Thomas, does, do these periods of, uh, of extreme volatility, do, they, do you th see increased interest in the ETF market as a result or, or, or less? Um, I think it depends which market segment we're talking about. Um, just mentioned was the institutional part and and there I would would agree um, you know a couple of, of, of years ago there were just a few really big asset pools uh, investing via ETF mainly on the tactical basis on adjusting some you know for example uh, the majority uh, of, of a bond a bond portfolio but what we clearly see is that's the part which is growing in particular because of that um, flexible use of ETF, uh, you know, the liquidity they provide, uh, the handling they allow to quickly adjust a big, big portion of, of, of a portfolio. Uh, I think that there I agree. Um, on the more um, retail intermediated side, I would say there is still a uh, big room to go grow in terms of the use of ETFs, but yes, I, I also see there um, an increased interest, interest of um, this portfolio tool, which you know allows allows a, a well diversified portfolio to be constructed. So we clearly see the wholesalers being the forefront there, uh, big institutional investors following quite quickly, and 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 as as we just heard, I think I agree, um, more and more of these big pots are using ETFs, and on the retail okay. side, it's really like a, a slow burner, which just uh, you know sees an increase of investors um, using ETFs in their portfolio construction. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Thanks to Athanasios uh, Sarafagis from Bloomberg Intelligence, who we spoke to at the start of that conversation. More from BlackRock's Stephen Cohen and Thomas Mertz from Vanguard coming up shortly. Let's take a look at what is hot in the world of ETFs this week. Which countries and sectors have been attracting the money? Sebastian Salek has been looking at the numbers. Seb. Well, Anna, what a week it's been for global markets. Here's how it's playing into ETF flows. This is FFLO Go I've got up here. You can see total inflows of three. $318 million into European ETFs. The biggest country, Germany, $217 million there. There's a twin play going on here. Part of this is an ETF that allows you to short the DAX. The other part is moving into bonds. Expe exactly what you'd expect in an environment like this with Germany very exposed to China, the hotspot for the coronavirus, and, of course, the biggest economy here as well. It wasn't exactly going great before coronavirus came across either. So we're seeing a lot of money going into German ETF. Switzerland as well. Don't worry too about, much about that. A bit of a misnomer. It's often money being moved about within UBS's funds. And the United Kingdom there, this is more institutional buying that just carries on as normal. It's not really strategic. It's 
is just continuing on. So we're seeing a lot of money, $138 million worth going there. To the downside, you're seeing a lot coming out of Italy. What is this? Let me get you a reading there. Right down there, $115 million. This is, as you might expect, the Italian economy taking a hit from the coronavirus. They're talking about doubling stimulus to 7.5 billion euros to take account of that. And France as well, one of the other countries that's being most affected by that outbreak. We're seeing outflows of 27 million. But on the whole, it's been a pretty good week for ETFs as investors use these sorts of uh, vehicles in order to play what has been a very turbulent time for global markets, Anna. Sebastian, thank you. Sebastian Salek uh, on the flows of the week. Let's discuss those with Stephen Cohen from BlackRock and Thomas Mertz from Vanguard. Uh, Stephen, no surprise, I suppose, that you see investors getting out of the periphery of Europe and back towards the core at a time when you're looking to uh, be more risk averse. And given that Italy played the role it did at the beginning of last week, I guess even more, even less surprising. Yeah, I think the flows, the flows and the market moves really do uh, reflect each other. Um, you know, if you look globally, to your point, kind of flows out of periphery back into safe havens. Uh, we mentioned earlier, flows into things like gold. Um, we've seen a lot of flow out of things like Japanese equities, so areas where um, arguably investors are more nervous around <coughs> the potential for recession and what's that's going to mean in terms of earnings season coming up. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing that's kind of not necessarily captured is there are some of the st more strategic longer term trends uh, actually continue to happen over the last couple of weeks despite the volatility. We continue mm. to see money uh, going into fixed income in general even though it came out of credit. Uh, we continue to see money going into ESG and sustainable investing and thematic investing. So um, I think despite some of the kind of more uh, tactical moves, um, some of those strategic growth areas of, of ETFs remain very, very solid. That's interesting. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about some of the thematics a little bit later on, uh, Thomas. In terms of the haven flows, the move into, into the, the sort of more haven-like ETFs, was there anything that caught your eye a move into gold ETFs we were discussing? Um, no, not in particular, because I think they are very short-term moves. Um, uh, we're, we're having more of it the long-term um, in, in, in the focus, and I think there is a, a clear trend towards more fixed income ETFs, and that, and that is covering both governmental as well as corporate exposures. Even, you know, we're offering quite some broad benchmarks. We, we saw some very nice flows into the broader uh, beta exposures, be it, be it on the fixed income side, but also on the um, equity side. Um, one, one word maybe towards the, the rebalance we saw. Um, we um, saw rebalance uh, not just out of equity, but as you just said, into more uh, stable markets. We saw some inflows into U.S. equities um, and away from some more peripheral markets, but also on the, on the fixed income side, obviously, as expected, out of, out of more uh, credit into, into more government flows. Thanks very much, Thomas Merce from Vanguard and Stephen Cohen from BlackRock, both staying with us here on ETF IQ Europe. Coming up, fancy taking a bet on the growth of the robotics industry. Well, there's an ETF for that. We'll bring you the details next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Anna Edwards. Welcome to the programme. Let's take a look at the February flows then, the flows for the month of February. It's been quite a month on the markets with stocks and bond yields tumbling as investors worry about the impact of the coronavirus. But despite heavy outflows from European ETFs in the final week of the month, February still saw a net inflow of 5.8 billion euros across asset classes. Uh, money poured into safer government bond products, but high yield bond ETFs suffered from investors' loss of risk appetites. Over the month, they saw outflows of 1.2 billion euros. Commodities, meanwhile, had their best month since 2006. 16, led by a rush into gold funds. So not all commodities created equal in this context. And even with the sell-off in the final week, equity ETS still managed a modest gain during February of 1 billion euros. Uh, now, time to dig into uh, one of the exchange-traded funds that you may not have heard of. Here's Sebastian Salek with this week's uh, There's an ETF for that. Anna, the question you've got to ask yourself, 
Are robots going to take over the world? If you think there's even an outside chance we could be welcoming our robo overlords anytime soon, here's one for you. The LNG Robo Global Robotics and Automation ETF. It tracks trends in robotics. It's been a transatlantic phenomenon launched back in 2013. It's huge for a European thematics fund, one of the biggest in the region and also one of the first to market and it's really benefited from that. It's gathered $770 million. Although, if you haven't heard of it yet, where have you been? You've had your head in the sand way back in 2017. That's when this was all the rage. Since the start of the year, we've seen it decline by some 8% as people just cool off a little bit on robotics. But it contains companies like Ocado, which we think of as a supermarket, a food delivery company. But a big part of it is licensing the technology that picks all those bits of food out from the warehouses. We've also got Qualcomm, which is big in the 5G space, making chips, that sort of thing. And Schneider Electric, one of the big European electric power product manufacturers. So there we go. Anna, the Robo ETF. Thanks very much, Sebastian. Sebastian Salik. Let's uh, continue our conversation around thematic ETFs. Despite surging volatility and a slowing global e uh, economy, thematic investing continues to be popular with investors. So can the sector continue to grow? And when will Europe catch up with the US? Stephen Cohen from BlackRock and Thomas Merce from Vanguard. Um, I don't know if there's an ETF for low, uh, for, for a situation where you've got lo such low sovereign bond yields, uh, Stephen, but that seems to be something of a, of a persistent feature of the market its response to coronavirus. I mean, thematic investing, how does it, how does it persist through all of this uh, seeming chaos in markets? So I think the one thing that we've seen with uh, thematic or equity investing in general, and it's really, we're seeing it through thematic ETFs, is how do you, within your portfolio, have your kind of core allocation, your, maybe your tactical allocation, and what are some of those longer themes that don't necessarily fit with the traditional model of countries and sectors and asset classes? And that's really where the thematic investing is becoming very, very popular. Uh, it's a long-term outlook. Uh, we're seeing it. You mentioned robo. We've seen a, a big growth of our robo ETF over the last two years. You're now si seeing it in areas like... Uh, things like smart cities, electric vehicles, so the crossover now between thematics and kind of some of the sustainable uh, investing as well. Um, and I think that's why generally these funds will grow over time in a kind of a longer, yeah. longer period. They're less susceptible to some of the kind of short-term uh, volatility of markets. Thomas, does the passion for all things ESG, all things environmentally friendly, does that continue through this market turmoil? What do the, what do the ETF flows tell us about that? Yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the starting rise of ESG um, flows or, or flows into ESG solutions have started well before any kind of these shocks. Um, but I, I, I totally agree. We, we've seen a massive increase in flows towards sustainable finance solution, be it on the act, active side, but also uh, definitely on the on the ETF side, as it just allows investors to, you know, give some access to ESG-based uh, solutions. So I wouldn't expect any kind of abrupt end of, of this trend. I think it's, it's clearly um, um, uh, guided by regulatory um, 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 directions uh, and, and investors' demand and the investors' preference for some kind of a st sustainable solution. So I see that the flows into ESG-based solutions uh, delivered via an ETF is definitely going to grow, um, uh, whether the virus um, is here or not. OK, Thomas, thanks very much. Thomas Merce from Vanguard and Stephen Cohen from BlackRock, both staying with us on the programme. Coming up, a win for active investors. New analysis suggests that in emerging markets, active funds are outperforming their passive funds. We will debate that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Anna Edwards. Let's take a look at the ETFs which are attracting the money this week. Here's Sebastian Salik. Well, Anna, there are two main areas where we're seeing money going into. One is the S&P 500. Weird, you think, maybe, for a week where we've seen all those sell-offs. But actually, this is more a case of playing the get the bounce. Cast your mind back to halfway through the week. We did see a bit of a reprieve in stocks, and that's what we're seeing going into the ETFs. The other side of it 
is gold. Where else do you want to be in a crisis? Bullion heading for its biggest weekly gain since 2016. Jeffrey Gundlach saying the best thing is now to own gold. And there we go. iShares and Invesco. We see those huge inflows into those individual ETFs. If you have a look at the downside, uh, you can see what's going on there. And it really reads as a list of places you don't want to be during a crisis like the coronavirus. European corporate debt, European high yield, these risky assets, they're having none of it. The money is coming out of these areas. Similarly with Japan, which has also been gripped by the virus and emerging market bonds as well. You're seeing all that contagion from China into these other countries, Anna. OK, thanks very much to Sebastian Salik. Now, let's get passive aggressive. New analysis by Bloomberg suggests that in emerging markets, at least, active managers have the upper hand, outperforming passive over three, five and 10 years. Uh, still with us, Stephen Cohen from BlackRock and Thomas Mertz from Vanguard. Stephen, uh, this, this debate, it's going to be ongoing, I'm sure. It's going to be with us for, for a long time. I mean, maybe the answer will be we need both. We'll, we'll see how long it takes us to get there. But uh, passive versus, uh, passive versus uh, active in terms of the emerging market space, do you, see, do, do you think, uh, where do you think we need to be positioned, passive versus active, at the moment? Uh, I, the debate is ongoing, although I think it's the wrong debate because I think everything <laughs> is active. So I think uh, one of the things people do need to do is kind of reframe and say active is making decisions around where to invest and then there is a decision of how am I going to do it and do I do it through an ETF, do I find an active manager, etc. There are places like uh, emerging market equities where I think that there is uh, idiosyncratic returns, I think there is opportunities for managers to perform if they can perform and deliver net of fees and I think that what investors increasingly are looking for is to say I've got to deliver an outcome in my portfolio and I've got to find the best way to actually deliver that and that outcome uh, and in many cases or increasingly actually mm. the ETF is the more efficient way to deliver that. Thomas, just briefly, uh, active versus passive is the wrong debate to be having at this point then? Absolutely, that's the wrong debate. Our view is <clears throat> it's not about active versus passive, that's the delivery mechanism. It's more about um, high cost versus low cost and, and, and the broad diversification uh, uh, and the goal which you want to achieve in the, in the portfolio. So we're, we're totally agnostic in terms of active or passive. What we think is very important okay. that investors take care of is that they uh, look at the cost. OK, Thomas Merz, thank you very much. From Vanguard, Stephen Cohen from BlackRock, thanks both for joining us. Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe.